I'm here in Pocoima, the San Fernando Valley portion of Los Angeles, and I'm here to talk about what happened here on January 31st, 1957, when a DCB aircraft crashed into another aircraft a couple miles away from here, with the DC crashing into this playground back here at this elementary school, killing three boys and injuring at least 75 others. We'll talk about it on this episode of History Hunters. With airports nearby, plane crashes were not rare in Pacoima, with small planes going down periodically in the 1950s and 60s. But what happened on this day was an unthinkable horror. I'm specifically here at Pacoima Elementary School playground. There was a mid-air collision between a military aircraft and the DC-7, which is being test flown for the McDonnell Douglas Corporation. Both planes crashed in separate locations, the DC-7 coming down in this location right here just as the bell had rung and kids were coming back into the playground. I'm gonna try to peek through the fence here, but uh, the plane basically broke up into three parts and slid in the direction off to the left, all the way across that playing field out there. Pieces of it actually slammed into a house that's on the other side of the street over there. I believe it's called Terra Bella. Now, fortunately, the bell had just rung. There were some kids straggling in. Most of them got out of the way in time, made it over here to the school, which basically looks the same as it did back in 1957. Unfortunately, three students were killed, and uh, of course, everybody on the plane was killed as well. Now, Richie Valens was going to school here at the time. However, he was not here that day. That plane crash was mentioned in La Bamba. It affected him because he was thinking about his own fate. Uh, and of course, you know that he did die in a plane crash as a musical star with uh, Buddy Holly and J.P. Richardson, the big bopper. The DC-7B, which was earmarked for delivery to Continental Airlines, took off from the Santa Monica Airport at 10.15 a.m. on its first functional test flight with a crew of four Douglas personnel on board. Meanwhile, in Palmdale, a pair of two-man F-89 fighter jets took off at 10.50 a.m. on test flights, one that involved a check of their onboard radar equipment. Both jets and the DC-7B were performing their individual tests at 25,000 feet in clear skies over the San Fernando Valley when at about 11.18 a.m. a high-speed near-head-on mid-air collision occurred. Investigators later determined that the two aircraft most likely collided at a point northeast of the Hanson Dam spillway. Curtis Adams, the radar man aboard the eastbound twin-engine F-89J Scorpion, was able to bail out of the fighter jet and despite incurring serious burns, parachuted to a landing on a garage roof in Burbank, breaking his leg. The jet pilot, Roland Owen, died when the aircraft plummeted in flames into La Tuna Canyon in the Verdugo Mountains. The DC-7B, with a portion of its left wing sheared off, remained airborne for a few minutes, then rolled to the left and began an uncontrollable, spiraling, high-velocity dive. It began raining debris onto the Pacoima neighborhoods as the aircraft began to break apart. Seconds later, part of the hurtling wreckage slammed onto the grounds of the Pacoima Congregational Church, killing all four Douglas crewmen aboard while the major portions fell on the adjacent playground of the Pacoima Junior High School. On the playground, where some 220 boys were just ending their outdoor athletic activities, the wreckage broke upon impact into numerous pieces and intense fires began due to the aircraft losing fuel and oil. Distinct craters were made in the playground by each of the four engines and the main center fuselage. Two students were struck and killed by the wreckage and debris. A third gravely injured student died two days later in a local hospital. An estimated 75 students on the playground suffered injuries ranging from critical to minor. I think a lot of us parents and grandparents who send our kids to school every day, expecting them to return home safely, can understand the, the grief that they must have felt knowing that they sent their children to school and they ended up dying in such a horrific way. The four victims aboard the ill-fated DC-7B were William Carr, the 36-year-old pilot. He left behind his wife, Margaret, and two children. Roy Nakazawa, the 28-year-old radio operator. He left behind his wife, Helene, whom he just married two months prior. Waldo Adams, the 46-year-old flight engineer. He left behind his wife, two sons, and his father. 
And then there was the 50-year-old co-pilot, Archie Raymond Twitchell, who also gained fame as a veteran movie actor. Archie was a captain in the U.S. Army Air Force and was the co-pilot on this test flight for McDonnell Douglas. Twitchell appeared in over 90 films, 19 of them westerns, between 1939 and 1951. His career took off after being knocked from a lifeboat by Gary Cooper in the movie Souls of the Sea. Director Henry Hathaway was impressed with his natural acting ability and gave him more film roles. Twitchell appeared in the 1941 western movie Prairie Strangers with Cliff Edwards, famously known as Ukulele Ike and the voice of Jiminy Cricket in the Disney film. His movie roles included The Vanishing Outpost with Lash LaRue and Fuzzy St. John. Under the stage name of Michael Brandon, he appeared as a slick gangster at a dude ranch in Gene Autry's Robin Hood of Texas. He also performed in five Roy Rogers movies, including In Old Amarillo. He was also a crooked lawyer versus Tim Holt in Thundering Hooves. He also appeared on screen in the 1948 film Fort Apache as a reporter in the group chatting with John Wayne at the end of the film. Radio transmissions caught the horror of the situation when Carr first transmitted uncontrollable, followed by co-pilot Twitchell who said, We're a mid-air collision, mid-air collision, we are going in. Uncontrollable, uncontrollable. We've had it, boy. Poor Jet 2. Told you we should have taken shoots. Say goodbye to everybody. Radio operator Nakazawa's voice was the last when he said, We are spinning in the valley. So there's the I-5 freeway. You would take the Terrabella exit right here, and it circles right onto Terrabella, and the school campus is right here. This playground is pretty much the same that it was back in 1957. The gymnasium, the buildings in the back, they're all the same. That's the way this would have looked back in 1957. And I'm trying to show you exactly the wreckage slid right through this playground, right into the street, right into this house over here. I have a picture of this house with debris that struck the roof and part of the front of it. Seems like when there's a tragedy of this proportion that somebody wises up and changes the rules, and such was the case after what happened here. The collision was blamed on both aircraft crews for improperly following sea and avoid procedures regarding other aircraft while operating under visual flight rules. The crash also prompted the Civil Aeronautics Board to set restrictions on all aircraft test flights, both military and civilian, requiring that they be made over open water or specifically approved sparsely populated areas. As the DC-7B spun out of control on a westward heading for about four miles before crashing, ninth graders were inside the school auditorium practicing for the graduation ceremony the next day. Linda Luttrell was delivering the final of four speeches in which she said, We all have but one life to live. The sound of the crash prompted Principal David Schwartz to send a teacher outside to find out what had happened and went to the microphone to calm his students, saying, That was just another sonic blast. We will go on with our program. When the power went out in the auditorium, Schwartz said in jest, I'm afraid that we must have forgotten to pay our light bill. Counselor William Albers was inside his office when he heard the crash and hit the floor. Seconds later, he ran outside and looked up to see the sky raining down aluminum pieces. Among the most seriously injured was 12-year-old student Richard Berger, seen here at left nearly two months as he was being released from the hospital. He recalled someone yelling, that guy's on fire, and realized it was him. He told somebody at the hospital, I looked at my hands and they were black and blistered. The cuffs of my jacket were smoldering, but my jacket was gone. When he was asked how he managed to get his clothes off, he replied, I didn't take them off, they were burned off. Richard had suffered third degree burns over 25% of his body, a deep gash across his back, and a large hole in the back of his left leg. His hospital roommate was Evan Elsner. After two days, Evan's bed was empty. I woke up one morning and he was gone, Richard said. No one said he died, but I knew he had died, and I wondered if he was in the room where they put the people who were going to die. Lives would forever be changed by the crash. Most physical wounds healed, but the emotional scars ran deep for the remainder of the lives of students who were hurt or witnessed the tragedy. The resiliency of youth was reflected in this photograph taken two months later when burn victims Richard Berger and Mark Woolley were treated to a surprise party after leaving Valley Hospital in Van Nuys. Life went on and the day after the crash, the ninth graders marched into the auditorium toward graduation exercises which were interrupted by the crash the day before. 
In this photograph, some of the youngsters entering the building were glancing toward the field where the disaster occurred just the day prior. Cleanup and repairs would take months. So not very far away from the school in Pacoima is a house that was standing here in the 50s. It's the house that Richie Valens grew up in. In fact, his mother continued to live there after he was killed in the air crash in Clear Lake, Iowa in February of 1959. That was less than two years after this crash in Pacoima. I was surprised to learn that Richie Valens was only 17 years old when he was killed. Okay, so we're gonna check out this is the home of Richie Valens, back in the 1950s. I know a lot of people have come out here. It's 13428 Remington. But this is the house that Richie Valens was living in when he attended schools here in Pacoima. I understand that this house was lived in by his mother. I see a chicken in the yard. That's pretty cool. But uh, we don't want to invade the privacy of the residents here. But uh, this is the actual house that La Bamba lived in. Very humble house here in Arlita, California. Looks like there's a lot of cactus and fruit trees here. And there's a chicken running around the neighborhood. Still a very humble place. Citrus trees and everything. Imagine future rock star Richie Valens walking to and from school right here in this neighborhood. So I do want to thank you for joining us on this episode of History Hunters. Not a pleasant subject to talk about, but uh, I think it's important that we understand history, because we learn from history, and we certainly learn from what happened here in San Fernando Valley back in 1957. I'd love to hear what you thought about this presentation, and if you could give us a like, despite the fact that it was a negative topic, we would also appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.